Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Battles We All Face podcast. This one is a special edition, and it is special because I'm actually joined by a guest. Many of our shows don't take part in this way any longer, but we're doing this very, very special today. And my guest today is an actor. He's a writer. He's the creator of the Emmy-winning digital series Studio City. He's an author, The Modern Gentleman, Sex Factor X, and The Way of the Cobra. Many of you will remember him as troubled teen Mike Barnes from the Karate Kid Part 3, but today is my special guest. Please welcome the awesome Sean Kanan. Sean, how are you doing today? John, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. I appreciate it. It is a pleasure, and I'm delighted to have you here. Um, I know things are busy in your life, uh, and obviously, you know, that there's lots going on, and I'm so excited. But I think today, you know, we're, we're going to get into mindset. We're going to look at different parts mm -hmm. of your journey a little bit as well. And I, I will respect your request, which uh, you, you emailed, which was, you know, you, you don't mind shooting from the hip, but let's go off the beaten track. Let's see where yeah. we go. That's that's a little bit different. So the, the first question I want to ask, let's go in deep. Um, the filming of Karate Kid Part 3, I think you've, you've talked about this a lot. I've seen in other interviews. Um, you had an incident, shall we say, that happened that almost cost you not only the part of Karate Kid 3, but also your life. Tell us right from the get-go, what happened? So um, I'd been filming for probably about two weeks and we were breaking for Christmas and I was going to go to Las Vegas with a, a friend and um, I had been experiencing some pretty significant pain in my left thigh, which I attributed to all the, the karate that I was doing because we were training extensively, uh, you know, not only to... Uh, be in shape, but also to learn all the choreography for the, yeah. the numerous fights that were in the film. So I started taking a, a bunch of aspirin. Uh, I drove through the desert uh, with my friend and we arrived in Las Vegas and uh, I was in the Dunes Casino and I, I passed out. And when I came to the EMTs were there and uh, they, they told my friend, they said, listen, you know, we have to take him to the hospital immediately. He's, he's lost a ton of blood. So what had happened was I was bleeding internally and the aspirin had exacerbated the, the bleeding. Uh, it was Christmas day, 1989. I was in Humana Sunrise Hospital in Las Vegas and I was fighting for my life. Wow. And, um, uh, they, they told me they weren't sure they could save my life. And it was, uh, to this day, still the scariest moment that's ever happened to me uh i i made it through the surgery prior to being put under i asked the doctor um if possible could he resect my abdominal muscles they were going to do a, a abdominal exploratory surgery because they didn't know where i was bleeding from and i knew if they cut through the abdominal yeah. muscles that i was going to be out of the film and so they did resect them and uh i came to i had a nasty 15 inch wound on my my abdomen with staples lining it um there was a guy in a bed next to me because they, they couldn't even find me a room a private room he wound up dying i didn't wow. see him after a couple days yeah we just just to give you a little color to the whole thing my father <laughs> my father was sitting in a chair across from the bed my parents who live in pennsylvania could only get one ticket at that late hour so they decided my dad would come and my mom would follow and my father was just gray i, I can't even imagine what that flight must have been like for him um and i got a call shortly thereafter from uh, the director of the film john abelson who had directed the karate kid one the karate kid karate kid two won the oscar for rocky and basically said look you got about 10 days to get back to work mm -hmm. and if, if not um you know we're gonna re we're gonna recast and and that was a a, a difficult but wonderful yeah. lesson because um you know, there's some there's some wonderful people that you can meet in the entertainment business, but it is show business, not show friends. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, you, you learn that with rare exception, your value in the business is predicated on your ability to, you know, be that cog in the machine. And that's what I was at that point in time. So um, uh, I, I, I started to get really angry. Um, I, I felt that it was unjust that i had gone through so much to get the role and that the universe was maybe taking it away and that was obviously sinking into a little bit of victimhood which which uh you know is not something that i uh or at least something i try not to do anymore um but i also um i was also angry that i was being treated this way by the production and and that anger very quickly shifted to becoming my why and it got me out of bed and you know the first day i could 
make it to the bathroom in my room. And the next day I could make it around the whole hospital floor. And day after I could make it around three or four times. And I had them discharge me from the hospital against medical advice. I wound up uh, returning to the set. Initially, they thought they were going to use a stuntman for all the martial arts. I started training with a guy from uh, an NFL football team to rehabilitate myself. And long story short, uh, I wound up doing all of my own stunts in the film with the exception of one stunt, which was a, a, a driving stunt where I'm in a car that goes across these train tracks as a speeding train comes by. Yeah. And I was like, I'm simply not going to be doing that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of the story of uh, how I almost uh, lost my life and lost the role for Karate Kid 3 and, and why that film is so important. I mean, mm -hmm. People think that that film has such a special place in my heart because, you know, because it, it gave me entree into... Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Karate Kid universe, which is a, a, a worldwide phenomenon, but that's not it. It's it's because at that very young age of, I think it was twenty two years old. Right. You know, I was I was faced with my own mortality. I was mm -hmm. faced with uh, an incredible challenge, and you know, in in that moment, at that point in time, I, I was able to rise to the challenge, and you know, it, it revealed a part of my character that I don't think had previously been revealed. It's really amazing. And, and you, you answered a couple of questions that I had there. You know, how old were you when you were going through it? You know, to be going through it at 22 years old, um, you know, it's it is. I mean, it's young. You know, it, you, you're a young guy. You know, you're going through these things. You go through this life threatening surgery and then you get a call that basically says, look, you got 10 days to get back to work or we're going to recast. And I literally jotted down, not everyone you talk to is going to be your best friend, because I found that when I got into this whole world, I used to work with the LA Tribune, I worked with a number of different things, and mm. it was the exact same thing. It was like, you know, we'll, we'll be your friends until you've signed on the dotted line, then we'll kind of distance ourselves from you. And you've kind of got to learn how to, nobody's going to fight for you, you have to do this yeah. yourself. Um, and I know we haven't known each other very long, but what I found after the interview that I produced last week, um, mm. when, when I actually finished the interview, or when uh, co uh, finished the interview, I don't know, I, I looked and I was like, there's a lot of parallels between you and I, um, <laughs> even though, you know, 20 years difference, but I was like, I, I get it. And I saw you in a very, very different way than I probably had with the Karate Kid 3. Right. Um, so it was, it was really interesting. How much of Mike Barnes's, I suppose, character really did you use then? I mean, obviously you can take that anger that's just happened to you and it's like, Daniel LaRusso's really going to get it now. You know, <laughs> he was, he was going to no, get I it before, but he's really going to get it now. I think there's a certain reality to that. I mean, as an actor, you know, you always try to incorporate what's going on in your yeah. life uh, because that tends to be a very honest and visceral um, emotional mindset. Um you know, I, I people ask me that a lot. I mean, it's funny because I'm I'm an advocate for anti-bullying. Uh, I serve as uh, one of the international youth ambassadors for a 501c3 called Buddha Bullying. Um, yet I played this iconic bully. Um, you know, I I guess I guess I have that ability to sort of summon that aggressiveness <laughs> and everything. Yeah. Um, it's it's not how I try to live my day-to-day -day life, but uh, um, I, I definitely like to believe at least that I'm a, a more evolved human being than uh, Mike Barnes, who was a 17-year-old sociopath. <laughs> Putting it mildly. But the thing, yeah. you know, that, that I can understand as well, because, you know, you do martial arts in your real life. It is a practice of your life. It has been for a long time, as it has with mine, from amateur wrestling to MMA to wrestling, you know, over. And I think there is something that only people that have done it can understand, because it sounds really bizarre. You can be completely at peace and yeah. you can be, you know, in, in your, you know, yogis and all of this other stuff. And yet... You can be standing across the room from someone who you know is going to try and tear your head off with sticks or, you know, you're going to be wrestling someone and you're going to be, but you still completely at peace about all of this. And I think, you know, again, like you said, you know, that there is that ability of being able to summon forth this character, because again, yeah. we're, we're made up of yin and yang, you know, light and dark all the time. Yeah. And um, I think it's a, a phenomenal thing at times to, uh, to, to be able to do. What was life for you like as a, as a child? Um, I grew up in a Western Pennsylvania steel town. I grew up in an affluent area, but it was a very mixed bag there. 
Um, you know, uh, I was, I experienced a lot of bullying when I was a kid. I was a, a chubby uh, kid with glasses. I was one of only five Jewish kids in the whole school, right. which, you know, that trifecta it didn't mm -hmm. make me uh, the most popular kid. Um, uh, we lived about five miles from the Amish. Okay. Uh, who lived out in the country. That was kind of interesting. You know, you'd see horse and buggies going by. And you wouldn't think twice of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I honestly lived a lot of my childhood in fear uh, mm. as, as, a, as a kid that got severely bullied. And um, I, I eventually found my sanctuary, which was the local movie theater. And it was there that I was introduced to my first mentors. You know, Clint Eastwood is the outlaw Josie Wales. <laughs> taught me about quiet cool and and rocky balboa mm. uh you know taught me about um you know being the underdog and coming back against uh you know the odds and um obi-wan kenobi about mindfulness mm -hmm. and i didn't realize it at the time but they were also planting the seed for me to want to eventually become an actor yeah and um you know eventually i found my way into uh a martial arts dojo and i began to you know shed that fear and build my spirit and build my body um i my parents were um terrific parents um i i you know had a had a very privileged uh upbringing i i did two years in public high school and two years in a sort of very elite private boarding school um you know, um, no, no, no major trauma or catastrophe with the exception of, you know, everything I went through uh, being bullied. Yeah, I think, you know, and again, like I say, you know, it, you know, we, we kind of parallel each other because that is something that I went through as a child. Um, mm -hmm. And again, Sorry. like you, I was perpetually terrified. I mean, I was, I was, and, and actually in the, the new book series that I'm working on that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, you know, that there's a quote in there that basically says, you know, I'm absolutely terrified of everything, you know, yeah. and, and I really was. That's probably why I got into bodybuilding, why I got into wrestling, why, because it's yeah. all of these defense mechanisms to try and protect yourself. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think it does change you as a child. And obviously yeah. the work that you do now with anti-bullying and everything there, I mean, it's a massive problem. It's a massive problem here in the UK. It's a massive problem over in the United States. Laurie Bishop yeah. and myself, obviously, who you uh, know fairly well, uh, we created a course, and that was one of the topics that came out of it naturally was all about bullying. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit, in fact. What are sure. the, the, the biggest issues that you're now seeing, particularly in the United States, um, with regards to bullying? Well, I think a lot of this starts at home. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that, I don't think, I know, unfortunately, in our country, there has been a marked decline in civility. Yes. Uh, I think that people, when they disagree with you, uh, are now inclined and feel it's okay to completely eviscerate your character yes. and the essence of who you are, rather than taking a position against an idea you have which I think is a huge mistake. Um, there's there's a thing called um, Hanlon's Razor. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with yeah, yeah. it. Uh, I'm probably going to botch it, but it basically says never attribute to malice that which can be explained by ignorance and stupidity. And a lot of times, you know, people, when they're disagreeing with you, um, you know, sometimes a disagreement's just that. It's a disagreement. It doesn't need to be an ad hominem yeah. personal attack. Um, so, so I think a lot of that, has contributed to uh, to bullying. Um, I know that the internet uh, and social media um, and, and cyber bullying is a tremendous problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when I was a kid, you get bullied, you know, on your way to school, coming back from school, yeah. you know, but now with the stroke of, you know, with, with hitting one keystroke, kids are getting bullied to hundreds, if not a thousand people 24 hours a day. And the problem is, you know, once something's up on the internet, it's there yeah. in, in perpetuity. And uh, I wish kids understood that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it really is. Um, it's a difficult problem. Um, you know, I think a lot of different things are at play. I think that there has been a um, 
demasculinization of of young men mm -hmm. because they're told that they're being toxically male mm -hmm. yes and yeah. they're not they're not being taught the very best aspects mm -hmm. of being a man and they're being chastised and ridiculed for other aspects and it's causing a lot of confusion and when there's confusion and mental chaos it manifests in a lot of negative behavior sometimes definitely and i, and I think what you know what i see because i mean i kind of cut myself off a, a lot from a lot of stuff that's going on deliberately um i think it gives me a more unbiased opinion and i think uh, the work that Sadguru is doing around the world with inner engineering and things you know, which is a practice that I personally adopt. I think if that was taught in schools and children were taught how to manage themselves a lot more and yeah. uh, actually how to kind of deal with themselves and understand their own mind, understand what's going on and why they're feeling the way they are, why this is all going on, I think you would eradicate the majority of bullying and eradicate the majority of mental health disorders that are there. Uh, it, certainly, it certainly wouldn't hurt. And yeah. I'll tell you another thing too. You know, I think Mike Tyson said it, too. He said, you know, there's a lot of a lot of keyboard wor warriors out there who feel completely comfortable saying the most vile things yep. that you would never say to somebody to their face right. because you'd be having your teeth for breakfast. <laughs> and, you know, I, I I don't advocate violence only as a last resort, but I, I, I believe that having a healthy respect of you know, conducting yourself in a certain way um, because, you know, you understand that there can be repercussions. Yeah. You know, some of the way, the things that people say to each other on the internet are just oh, yeah. horrendous. Yeah. And, 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 and somehow it's, it's um, uh, it seems to be okay in mm -hmm. people's minds to do that. And I don't know where that comes from. It's it is a mindset that has evolved again, and I think it's a little bit like swearing on TV. You know, it started out with a one tiny little cuss word, maybe like bloody, and then it's ended up with f this, f that, and it gets more and more extreme as the time yeah. goes on. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I remember speaking to a friend of mine who's a DI, and uh, you know, he um, basically said a lot of people don't realize this, but everything that you write on the internet can be taken down as a legal, you know statement as a legal thing because it's a physical act that you have written this and especially if you put up videos so he's like you know make sure you're really careful what you do because as always you're going to reap what you sow more than you sow later than what you absolutely sow. And, never uh, never write anything out of anger that's uh, you it. know uh, yeah because it's it's there forever yeah and, and, and don't realize that and and as you rightly said you know i mean it, it's it's become this norm now where people just feel it's okay and it's not just in kids I mean, again, we were talking about business before uh, we came on on air. You know, I've had everything over the last 20 years. I don't get it so much anymore. But when I started, I had death threats. You know, people really? say to me, you know, if you don't do this. And the funny thing was, because I was working with um, lower paying clients, I'll put it politely, but I was working with lower paying clients. Yeah. And I found some of them, not all, majority of people I worked with were salt of the earth people, but it was the, the ones and twos and threes that were really difficult. You know, we're going to come to your house. We're going to do this. And I'm like, you're not going to do anything. But it, at that point, I can say that yeah. now, but at that point, it was sheer terror. Sure, of course know? it was. You know, and it's, and it's and there's a weird, um, it's, it's almost, I don't know if oxymoronic is the right word, but, you know, people will get so incensed with this, this sort of woke mentality mm -hmm. and take such umbrage on behalf of another group. Yeah. But, you know, if you disagree with them, you know, it, it, it's open game. You know, it's, it's open yeah. season. You can say whatever you want. Yep. But in, in other respects, you know, so many people are, are just looking to be offended by something yeah. and, and uh, you know, assume that mantle of victim. And they'll never I mean, be disappointed because you will always find something. Exactly. Yeah. If you, look, if you look to be offended, you will not have to look hard. Yeah. The, the crazy thing about it, Sean, you know, two, two things that come to mind. The first one is, you know, people often believe the one who gets there first. You know, it, it's, yes. it's, it's always that, even if you're right or wrong. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, with this mentality, it's like, you know, whose bandwagon can we get along? You know, what, what can we do? How can we? And they're usually the people that say we want equal rights for everyone. We want everyone to be loved. We want to support people until we don't agree with them. You know, <laughs> so yeah. everyone will love you until they don't agree with you. So it's, it is, it's interesting for sure. Um, you know, all that's going on. And I, and I think it has to start, as you rightly said, at home. I see uh, too much 
brokenness in our society and the family dynamic is is being lost. It's been replaced by TV and by, uh, you know, the mobile phone now and everything else. And people are losing the ability to be able to communicate and even to read. I mean, majority yeah. of people read one book a year, if that, you know, that's the frightening statistics. You're, you're spot on. You're spot on, you know, and, and it's only been um, exacerbated with COVID because now you've got, you know, an entire generation of kids that have missed out on being properly socialized yeah. because they've been wearing masks and doing, um, you know, uh, Zoom schooling. And, you know, at the most critical juncture of their life to learn socialization yeah. skills, they're further, um, what's the word? Um, you know, you know, they're, they're further detached. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's been a, a, a marked decline in their, um, you know, face-to-face -face interaction with people. Yeah. And, and it is, I mean, losing the ability to be able to talk to one another in a coherent manner. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And, and, you know, and, you know, and, you know, problem solve things socially, mm. you know, you know, you will constantly find yourself in conflict with people socially, but if you are equipped with good social skills yeah. and critical thinking, you know, there's no reason that those can't be learning experiences instead of, you know, um, manifesting into something that is just completely um, detrimental to everybody and, yeah. and possibly dangerous. Definitely. I mean, just to kind of round that out, you know, I, I did a, a teaching right at the beginning and it's, it's called the Rubik's cube. And the purpose of the Rubik's cube is you're locked in one position and all you can see are the nine squares that sit in front of you. And you can talk to the other person either side of you and above and below you, but yeah. the majority of people won't, they will be adamant that these nine squares are red, blue, green, white, whatever. And everyone else has a different perspective. And, Confirmation uh, bias. That's it. And until we are willing to listen to one another without getting so angry, we're never going to yeah. learn. You know, it's, and it's as simple as I think, that. I think another thing, too, I've been thinking about this a lot. And, um, you know, without, without getting political or anything, you know, <laughs> abortion right now is something that everyone's yeah. really talking about in the United States. And, and it's such a, a polarizing topic. Mm -hmm. um, I think... I think it's a, it can be a bit of a metaphor because, you know, we've got to stop looking at everybody's viewpoints so monolithically. Yeah. In other words, you know, the left thinks this, the right thinks this, this thinks this. That most people, most people have opinions that lie somewhat on one side or the other of a topic, but they're nano shades of gray also. Yeah. And it's those intersecting shades of gray that allow us to find common ground, you know? Yeah, definitely. Most people are not so polarized, but now, you know, we're refusing to look for the commonalities mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're making these sweeping judgments of who someone is based upon a moniker that's being attached yeah. to them. Most of the times that moniker is attached by the person who is in in conflict with them? You know, it's not even something that that the other person would call themselves, and um, you know, it's it, it's the same thing as you know, politicians will look at one voting block mm -hmm. of people, whether it's um, African Americans or it's it's Latinos uh, or women or whatever, and say, okay, be, be, by virtue of the fact that they all belong to this one group, they must they must all monolithically agree to yeah. all the same talking points and that's absurd you know Dodo Miller shared a great post the other day and it was uh so again something along the lines of you know the one party is under the delusional idea that they can destroy the other party uh, and their views and everything and it's a delusion because you're always going to get a liberal you're always going to get a conservative you're always going to get this and you're always going to get that and actually when you go down deep into it and psychology students know this, it's actually a mindset. You, you actually have a psychological mind or you have uh, that, that, that's either a liberal or that's a conservative. And that's where right. this is coming from. And people again, and it's again, I, dare I say, I, <laughs> you know, it's like the dumbing down of society. Um, because once you understand that, it's like, guys, stop being played here and realize you can have a conversation with the liberal. You don't need to go to war with them. Yeah, as we course. saw with Donald Trump's uh, final rally or whatever it was. But I think it's a really exciting time. I've just finished doing a teaching actually on YouTube um, that'll go out tonight. And it's, uh, it, you know, because we're living in a time now of such inflation and such, you know, again, panic and fear and all this kind of stuff, 
I came out the other day with, in a seminar and I said, you know, it's a really exciting time for people. And they were kind of like, how the heck is this really exciting? Do you know what's going on in my life? And I said, yes, because if you know your history and you look back through history, you look and you say, right, well, times are really difficult and things are really struggling, but, um, you know, amazing things were able to happen. Right. And, you know, it, it, you know, people then start to become innovative and creative and they find um, solutions to these problems. Yeah. And that's the amazing thing about it is people are now starting to get, um, you know, excited about it and say, well, what do we do with regards to these energy prices and regards to gas prices? How yeah. can we make solar stuff um, more, more, okay. you know, exciting things? So it's an exciting time for sure, I, I, I uh, think. Is there anything you want to add before we move on? No, I think it's just interesting to, you know, I, I love the fact that we're sitting on opposite sides of the ocean, able to have this conversation and, and you know, w without really necessarily knowing what each other's um, views are on a multitude of subjects, you're able to have a civil conversation. Yeah. It's not only a civil conversation, but it's one where hopefully we're both learning something and exchanging ideas. That's and it. and it, it, it does start uh, on the grassroots interpersonal level and hopefully permeates upward. That's it. And you I know, think often it's groups. reading people's energy as well, because, yeah. you know, we're yeah. both very relaxed, you know, we're both very chilled out. Um, I know we were talking about this, and I think it's a good time to bring it in with regards to life coaches and, uh, and mentors and stuff, because I see more and more nowadays, even those that I used to follow when I was a teenager, the, the, the majority seem to be getting anger confused with passion. And I hear, you know, some mm. of the world's most famous, um, you know, life coaches now are always telling you, you got to have more, you got to be doing this, you got to be doing that. And they're so angry with what's coming out. And I'm thinking, okay, if you guys are going that way, then I'm going this way because yeah, I, I, yeah. I can't assign anything that is is so angry and everything. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I find that even in my books, and that's part of the reason that I know for myself, uh, to answer the, the question from earlier on, that's why I don't label myself as a life coach, um, but a mentor at best, because yeah. I really don't want to be associated with that world. And I find with my books, because I'm a very creative person, um, that yeah. I can help, actually help, you know, millions of people with this new series that's coming out. For, yeah. uh, for doing very, very, you know, for, for doing the work, um, but impact them in a different way. So as we talk about books, talk to us a little bit about your books, because you've got some exciting stuff going on. I do. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of knee deep right now in writing the sequel to um, my latest book, which is Way of the Cobra. I just happen to have a copy of it right here. <laughs> Uh, and, and that's really exciting. It's called Way of the Cobra, Welcome to the Kumite. That's going to be the, uh, uh, the sequel. And um, I'm, I, I'm actually uh, not filming this entire month. Uh, my show, The Bold and the Beautiful, is on hiatus this month, which has been great because it's given me the time to really um, dig in and uh, uh, you know, work towards finishing this book. Um, Way of the Cobra has had uh, just an incredible effect on a lot of people. I hear literally every day from people around the world. And so I'm, I'm so excited to finish the next book and, and get it to everybody. And, you know, it's been a tremendous learning experience for me, too. I, I've, I've gained so much because, you know, when you in my book, uh, I the structure is that I'm, I'm the sensei and you're in my dojo. And, um, you know, elevating myself to the position of being a teacher, a sensei, necessitates that I walk it like I talk it. And so putting Way of the Cobra out and putting the um, the new book out is an excellent way for me to remain accountable in my life. Definitely. And so there definitely is a, a reciprocity uh, between what I get from the people that read my book and the process of writing it rather than just what I'm, I'm bringing to the people who read it. It's an amazing experience, isn't it? Because I know when uh, I started writing The Battles We All Face, which is obviously to, to the side of me, um, and that series, you know, initially it was just one book and it, it came because somebody said, you know, hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, well, yeah, I've kind of got this, you know, um, stuff going on. And I take 40 of the most complex things, such as anxiety and trauma and how to let go and all that kind of stuff. And I condense it down into one page and make it really simple. And, and, and nice. don't ask me why, <laughs> but, you know, explaining that anxiety is nothing more than fear, fear of the past, fear of the future, fear of what could yeah, be. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the again, like yourself, the feedback that I got from that was, why do doctors make things so difficult? As it's simple, because especially if you're in the U.S., they want to make it difficult. So they seem, you know, more superior. So you keep coming back to them and you keep paying them. Yeah. 
and it's yeah. and and to a degree it's like the donkey you know and, and the stick you know or the donkey and the carrot it, it's it's keeping you where you're at as opposed to here's the answer let, let, let's move forward um we've got one that's going to be coming out at some point i've, I've started working at called the battles teenagers face because i think that's one that, yeah that Boy, that sounds be, really yeah ne needed and it's, you know, again, looking at 50, this one, I think, is actually 52. So it's one for every week um, of the most common issues that teenagers are facing. And again, I, you know, pack it with my artwork, pack it in a very uh, uh, historical style and, uh, and and make it something unique and different. And that's what I'm crying out for is, is people, guys, you know, it's great that you're doing all your stuff and you're, you're trying to save the world and everything. But sometimes you just need to take a step back and stop and just say, OK, what are we actually doing here? What What's going on? And uh, making sure you're taking care of, of the central point first. Um, but I'm excited for your book. Okay. I think it's it's tremendous, uh, you know, what's, what's going on and what's happening. Um, is there anything, because I know you're, you're uh, short on time today, uh, but as, as we look into, I suppose let's look at maybe even into your spiritual life. What does that kind sure. of look like on a on a day-to-day -day basis for you? So for me, um my spiritual life is uh, very much rooted in living in the present. Mm -hmm. um, I start my day the same every single day. I, I get on my knees. I, you know, I communicate with my creator and, and uh, thank whatever, whatever it is for, for all that I've been given, you know, and um, it does exactly what you were talking about. It keeps me in the present because when you're, when you're rooted in gratitude, you're living in the present. Yeah. You're not, you know, we become anxious as you know, because we're worried about a future that we, we have no idea how it's going to unfold. Yeah. And you know, what people call depression, I'm, I'm of course not talking about clinical depression, yeah. Yeah. but what people call run of the mill garden variety depression is because you're fixated on the past. Uh, usually regret, That's remorse, it lost opportunities, et cetera. So I keep myself rooted in the present. And, um, you know, one of the cornerstones of, of my spiritual life mm -hmm. is uh, being of service, um, you know, trying to bring value to every relationship in my life, always looking for um, a win-win scenario rather than a zero-sum game. Um, and uh, that and... You know, a lot of a lot of what I've learned in martial arts, you know, humility, compassion, strength, confidence, um, all of which is in my book, Way of the Cobra. Um, and I don't know, uh, you know, understanding that, you, you know, we staying in the process. And by that, I mean, just doing the next right thing. In other words, staying out of the results, understanding that very rarely can human beings see the 30,000 foot view often what initially appears as something that's negative or catastrophic with the expansion of time can prove to be valuable and a teacher and and you know just living my life in a way uh where i maintain my character and integrity and and you know realize that results are you know out of my hands yeah Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, again, all we can control is ourselves, you know, yeah. pretty much and, yeah. and how we respond to things. And I think, like you said, you know, with, with regards to uh, depression, uh, and, and again, we're, we're not talking about the chemical imbalance, we're talking about right. feeling of depression. Uh, yeah. Like so many things, all that's happened is we've become a victim of our own intelligence. You know, it, it's our intelligent mind that turns against us, because we're not in control of ourselves as soon as we start taking control of ourselves you actually realize wait a second there isn't that much that's going on right now that 33 trillion years into the future when all of this stuff is gone it really right. matters you know um i saw a, a photo uh, i don't know maybe last year or something and it was of the earth from the moon and uh in that picture i suddenly realized how small everyone's problems are <laughs> you know and when you have that mindset of actually let's look from beauty to you know to, to whatever's going on um it, it stops you from panicking and worrying and having that you know uh outburst a lot and i think you know again it, it's i think a lot of this stuff is a lot simpler to fix than people actually well, of course it is but but of the course. issue from I was just going to say the issue for a lot of people is that they're trying to fix everything. And if they go on fixing everything, there isn't going to be a planet left. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with that. And, you know, look, ultimately control is an illusion. Yeah. 
And the only thing we have control over is, is our reaction to external stimuli, how we choose to emotionally respond to the things that happen. And I think, I think if people really concentrate more on the difference between happiness and meaningful happiness, and, you know, happiness is, it's a reactive thing based upon, um, uh, and if then, in other words, if this happens, then I'll be happy. Yeah. You know, meaning, meaningful happiness for me is you, you can you can be having a really shitty, difficult, challenging, frustrating day and still be happy. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're walking around with a smile on your face like an idiot, but it means that your center is that you are um, a, a balanced, happy human being engaged in temporary difficulties. Yeah. And um, that's something in my in my life that has really helped me. You know, once I stopped looking for things externally to make me happy, yeah. uh, I got a lot happier. And, it's, it's you know, incredible that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, people look for every, you know, you know, food, sex, uh, alcohol, drugs, all a myriad of different things. And, you know, their, their temporary fixes all angled towards getting the award of stopping temporary stress and anxiety. In a reality, um, you know, once once the the initial reward is received, it 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 dissipates, and you got to find it again. If, it, you it. know, and and it's it, you know, you're, you're just chasing your tail. Yeah, and that's where obviously addiction comes into to play. Uh, that's an area that I worked in, gosh, ten years ago, um, and that I not only studied but I worked in many of the drop-in centers around, uh, certainly around the UK, and. Uh, you know, I, I found that it, again, like you say, you, you're chasing your tail because you're always going for that bigger and, and next fix because the brain continuously being the great host that it is continuously says, well, you enjoyed that last time, even if it's well, it get, yeah, it get it gets even more complicated than that. Because, look, you know, the first time you you try something, it's a habit and you're rewarded, you're, you're flooded with dopamine. But then what happens is, you know, take, for example, something that's negative, like uh um, you know, comfort eating. Okay. Mm -hmm. You you get stressed out. You have uh, something, you know, you have a big piece of chocolate cake and your brain is flooded with dopamine and you feel better. Right. Well, the next time that you get stressed out, now all you got to do is look in the refrigerator and see the chocolate cake yep. in anticipation of the reward. Your brain's going to flood with dopamine. And the problem happens when, um, you know, it, it no longer works anymore. In other words, you try an action, yeah. but it's unsuccessful. Next time your dopamine is served in a much smaller shot glass. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, you know, there is, there's some biochemistry, there's some psychology. And I think it's exciting that right now we are living in a time when people do seem to finally be more interested and committed to self-awareness and getting on the path. You know, the, the, the Eastern cultures, the Chinese, Japanese, Indians have been doing this for yep. eons. Yeah. You know, understanding that the study of self is critical to our, our meaningful happiness. And, you know, That's Americans, we're, we're a young country. We're just over 200 years old. And we're finally starting to understand, or at least some people are, that you got to start looking inward to make yourself feel better. Absolutely. I mean, I was a youth minister for 15 years. And, uh, you know, I, again, I, I saw a lot of the unfortunate circumstances that are often hidden away of the church. And I know when I left, I left there with a lot of issues that took years to really get over. And I tried everything. I mean, I, you know, again, you, your prayers and everything else, all that kind of stuff. Again, it's all external. Um, I've talked about this on other shows that, you know, I, I was sit listening, you know, last year, last January, and for no reason at all, Wayne Dyer, um, for a guy from back in the 1970s, was a very yeah, famous, yeah. Um, very famous guy. Um, his everyday wisdom came on my earphones, and within two hours, all the bitterness, the the hostile stuff, all the stuff that was really, you know, dragging me down, um, to to the point I probably wouldn't be here now. It went, and it went like that again. Yep. It was one of the divine things I've had several of them in my life, and it's phenomenal then to be able to speak with such passion because you always know. When someone's BSing you and claims to have done something and it claims to have this, but you know the ones that tell the truth as well. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a phenomenal experience. And again, I think, like we said right at the beginning, for, for people that are, are dealing with a lot of these issues and dealing with a lot of these struggles, you've got to go inwards. The external stuff is not going to last, you know, and not going to provide those lasting solutions for you. Um, and I think, you know, it's uh, a beautiful thing. Jo jo Joseph Campbell said that the the treasure you seek 
is in the cave you fear to enter. That's it. And it's so true. It's, uh, or he said something close to that anyway. And, I, like, uh, I like the old vision. And, I think that's good. <laughs> and I'm, I'm one of the great paraphrasers. And uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's so true. It, you know, nobody gets, nobody, there's no free lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you wind up doing the work one way or the other. You either wind up doing it consciously and intuitively or you keep making the same mistakes again and again and again. And, you know, the, the universe starts by tapping you on the shoulder. And by the time, you know, it's done with you, it's smacking you in the face. That's it. So, you know, because there are lessons that we all have to learn, um, you know, and, and we learn them one way or the other. And a lot of people would argue if, if, if you don't learn them, you come back again to learn them yep. in a different incarnation. So, um, <laughs> yeah. It's phenomenal. Uh, Sean, we've covered so much in this episode and I've enjoyed yeah. it. And uh, I, I love having these conversations. I really do. Is there anything you want to cover before we wrap up for today's show? You know, I just like to tell everyone how to get my book. Please do. Um, yes. You know, I tell people all the time, I, I, I do a lot of podcasts and things. And of course, I want to sell books. That's what you do when you have a book. But I honestly believe with every fiber of my being that the information in my book is transformational. And, you know, I, I say this. I'm sure that the stuff in your book is fantastic too. Read my book. Don't read my book. Read something, read yeah. something, you know, get on the path, start learning. And the thing that you'll find out is that there are tremendous common denominators um, when you're doing work on yourself. In other words, there are certain things that are simply true. Yeah. You know, Jesus, Jesus said that which you reap, so shall you sow. But, you know, Buddha talked about the law of karma, cause and effect. There are certain things that are true, and it comes down to the messenger who's giving you the message. Um, if, if I'm not the guy to give it to you, John, maybe you are. And if you are, maybe, you know, Tony Robbins, whoever. But, but just do something. So anyway, my book is available on Amazon uh, and Kindle. Uh, it's called Way of the Cobra, or you can get a signed and personalized copy at wayofthecobra.com. And I leave my DMs on social media so you can reach out to me i love hearing from people and i do my best to try and get back to them all the time and it's super awesome and it, again you know one of the options sean you didn't explore you could just buy both books you know we, we could go down that route you know <laughs> exactly i like that there you go by mine by john's that's it and i'm also available on audiobook as well that's that's a, a little thing um but sean it's been so much fun obviously we'll keep in touch because i think you know that there's so Please. much stuff that's going on and i even see possible business opportunities that are there sure. as well um, and I'm excited. So my friend, thank you so much for being, uh, thank you so much. I hope you have the guest. chance to do this again, John, take Absolutely. care of yourself. Take care, okay, my buddy. friend. Bye God bye. bless. Bye bye. Well, friends, we want to thank Sean for being our special guest this week. We had a little bit of technical issues on my side there, uh, but it's been an absolute tremendous amount of fun. Uh, definitely go and check out Sean's book. And if you're interested in checking out my book, you can, of course, at thejohnmorris.co.uk. All the links are going to be in the section below. And uh, until next time, take care. God bless. Have a phenomenal week, my friends. Namaste. And we'll see you very, very soon. Take care.